Hello and welcome to Green Planet, Blue Planet podcast, highlighting artists, teachers, authors, and philanthropists who are committed to planetary purpose, or in other words, holistic visions for planet Earth. My name is Julian Guderlai, and in today's episode, I'm hosting an interview with Lance Asios. Lance is the host and creator of University of Adversity. He teaches people how to shift their perspective on adversity by understanding that although adversity may feel like one's worst enemy, it is actually our greatest ally. His mission is to connect with unique and inspiring individuals and showcase their journey and what they've gone through in order to become successful in their lives. Tune into the show. I've been recently featured and had a blast sharing with Lance on his podcast, University of Adversity. University of Adversity. He is on a roll and shares episodes three times a week with gold-filled lessons of inspiration, resilience, and bravery. And so with these words, welcome to the show, Lance. Ah, oh, thanks for having me, man. Great intro. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely, dude. <laughs> I I love your show and I had a blast being interviewed by you. And I think it's time to have you on Green Planet, Blue Planet hear all about your life, your journey, the adversity you've gone through that makes you you now and the dreams the dreams you have for this world. Yeah, awesome. Well, for for myself, it all I've had let's probably three different personas in my life, you know. One was the hockey player, second one was a bartender, third one was the entrepreneur slash podcaster. Um, and it's quite interesting how we take on these different personas and we buy into that for a certain period of time, which fascinates me. But I started out trying to, you know, make it to the NHL and hockey, you know, the National Hockey League. Didn't make it, made some really poor decisions as we do it early 20s which led me down into a toxic path of kind of trying to find myself. I didn't realize it was toxic at the time, but in hindsight, you look back and you go, wow, that, was, that wasn't the best thing. So got into something that I, was, I, I started to like. I liked bartending and I liked connecting with people in restaurants and bars and all that. I tried a bunch of other things. Nothing really connected with me. I've tried uh, trades. I've tried all these different jobs. And I was like, I was missing this like human connection. I needed people. So bartending and all the service industry allowed me to get into that. So that took on its own set of challenges, which led me down a very, very toxic path, but it was also balanced out with a lot of good times. So some of the best times, some of the worst times in my life, um, which allowed me to, to bring me to Australia where I was able to live and work running bars, but also again, living a very, very toxic life. And during that time, I was challenged with some very, very challenging things. And, you know, losing my younger brother to suicide was one of them, which was, which caught me off guard, caught everybody off guard. I mean, when are you ready for something like that? And while that was, my dad was visiting me at, with me in Australia when we got the news. So I had to kind of paint the picture to him of what just happened. So you can imagine how crazy that was. And I've told this story before, but you know, I, I love to kind of give the insight into like how this all, how I kind of evolved into who I am now. So yeah, after that, begin, yeah. after that, you know, I was kind of like, well, you know, what's going on here? You know, like I'm, at the time, I'm 30 something, 32. I'm living, I'm drinking, I'm going to work. I'm not doing anything that's fulfilling my purpose. I feel like I'm drinking to cover some sort of like, I don't know what, I didn't know what. So I gave up booze for 2017. I decided to keep doing the bars. But once I, once I realized that that no longer served me when I didn't drink, I quit and I, and I got into the entrepreneurial world. So then I tried, then I moved back to, to Vancouver got back into the life here, but then got back into the booze. Wait, wait, wait a yeah. second though. So yeah. you, you were, you were still operating bars for yes. uh, like really high level establishments, but you stopped drinking yourself. Meaning, yeah. Meaning you were just watching that whole show sober. Yeah. So I, um, I started actually working at the four seasons in Sydney and I was helping run a bar there completely sober. And as you can imagine, things, things, things were a lot different because I was so used to, um, expecting to make a mistake or expecting me to do something that would allow me to lose my power so that I'd always feel like, 
I don't know. In the past, I always managed to screw up some way in my other jobs because of, you know, some sort of drinking or some sort of like laziness that came from that. And I didn't have that. And I always felt on top of my game. And I thought, wow, this is amazing, you know? And as I kind of evolved into that person being sober running a bar, although my creativity was great for cocktails, I just realized I didn't care about this industry anymore. Yeah. Like, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I enjoyed connecting with the human beings that came in, but I didn't enjoy poisoning them for a living. And look, I'm not here to knock that industry. I think it's a beautiful industry in so many ways. It brings people together for whatever reason. I, it, had a, it shaped me, so I'm not here to knock it. But for me, it was time to move on. I wanted to have a, I, I knew I had a greater purpose. I knew that I enjoyed the, that is what I liked is the human experience. Like, Hey, totally. coming in, finding out, you know, finding out about this person, like, Oh, this person's not very talkative. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to crack this shell, you know? And like, I really enjoyed that. And, you know, after that, I realized I just, this isn't, you know, when I was time to kind of come home to Vancouver, I sort of just left that behind and I never went back. So then I started to get into. This is really curious to me because I, I love the stories of transformation that people go through and you, you called it like those characters, right? Like in the movie of our life, we, we do embody personas and yeah. there, are, there are moments, I guess you listening can, can relate where you're like, which part of that is even me, right? And so yeah. different versions of who we are come out in different environments and different phases of our life. And I think in the story you're sharing, Lance, it's really clear, like you were looking for something, right? Yeah. And I didn't know I was looking. Be and when you're, when you're drunk every single day, like I'm talking, like I had, I was drinking a lot, a lot, but you don't know what you're looking for because you never allow yourself to connect because you're constantly numbing yourself of any feel, right? You don't feel things. So I knew something inside of me, um, was stirring up, but I didn't know what. And, you know, it's funny because I read a book probably a couple of years before that, that really shine, uh, shone a light on, uh, shine, shine, whatever, however you say that, um, a light on, on this in that I was reading these books that were kind of like depressing biographies almost. And I was make, they were making me feel bad. So I decided, well, what if I get one that kind of lifts me up? So I got the power of now, believe it or not. Oh, wow. And, and that's that, a catalyst for sure. That one, that one book, although it was still three years prior to the big change, that's what stirred, that's what got the juices flowing. I started to think like, wow, this is, this is crazy. Like what, like how, what, like what is, what is this guy talking about? And I had to listen to it. And then I started to get into more like kind of tap into more like uh, meditation books and Buddha stuff and all this kind of stuff. And that sort of sparked that, but that kind of was, that was sort of like just got the, got the wheels turning, but I didn't know that I was looking for anything, right? And I didn't realize that until I kind of stripped away the toxic life of the booze and stuff that that's kind of what I was looking for. Does that make sense? It makes so much <laughs> sense. And I think when we talk about those characters that we, we express and embody, um, and everyone has their own experience with that. I, th I think to a degree, it is really healthy to have different personalities that uh, come to play or different traits of personalities that make up the entirety of who you are. Um, but transformation is a real experience, right? And we're at a time on our planet where we, we want nothing more than a transformation of our consciousness, like an expansion. And so yeah. going from the, the, the athlete hockey player to the, the, the first real true thing that I heard in there is like, you love connecting with people. Like yeah. how beautiful is that? Right. Mm. The yeah. detour it takes is the detour it takes, but it's like a remembering or re-remembering of those teachings that then steadily opened your own shell. You just said earlier, like at the bar, you would have the feeling of, I want to open that person's crack their shell and, and, and get into a conversation and have them yeah. feel good. But these messages that are a little bit more, um, yeah, they're going deep, right? Like the, the power of now, uh, new earth, all these books that, Eckhart Tolle wrote or, or Deepak Chopra is really famous for those, those kind of literatures, um, literature pieces as well. They truly connect us to something deeper. Yeah. They just allow you to think, you know, they allow you to expand your thinking other than what, what is here. Right. And 
it's, I think it's really for people. See, I find it's fascinating how we have, and this is a topic that I want to do as well on my show is that why do we take over? Why do we choose that box, that persona in that period of life? There's all these things, there's all these opportunities, but why do we cling on to that thing? And then why do we let go? Because it's just a choice. It's literally a choice and decisions that align with that choice that make you who you, that thing is. So you can, you can transform that. It's just a matter of deciding that you don't, you want to do something else. And it just fascinates me how we get so, so, so um, committed. And so like, uh, what's the word for it? <clears throat> to that, we get so connected to that identity yeah. that we're afraid to let it go. And as you, you know, and to bring on something new. And I just find that fascinating. Because, it is very fascinating. You know? you know, I mean, you just said it then there is, it's just a choice and the matter of the beliefs that reinform those choices. Yeah. But then throughout our lives, we actually go through multiple transformations. Either they come from the inside and are truly like connected or they are shifts that happen because a hockey career didn't pan out or drinking became an obviously toxic behavior that you wanted to and had to change. And so these transformations happen if we are aware of them or not. Yeah. Right. So for me, the, topic of personality or ego is a very interesting one because in a lot of um, spiritual communities or, or groups where spirituality is kind of um, being, being dissected, the ego is often seen like an enemy. And I, I personally totally disagree with that notion because we are in the body to express spirit through a personality. And so our personality, when it's not driving the show, but it's in the back seat, it actually becomes a helpful assistant. Don't let it be your boss. But if it's an assistant and you, you, can, you can choose that personality expressing in a way that serves your true seed, the seed of your soul, magic is, is bound to unfold. Yeah, oh, absolutely. It's just being aware of that. You know, that's, and, and, you know, it's those conversations we have with ourselves. And everybody has them. You know, and if you actually have it aloud, like, okay, I see what I see what you're doing there. I see what you're thinking. It's okay. Don't be a, don't be afraid. You know, like, it's like, it's you literally everyone has these conversations, but when you start to talk about them, you know, when you actually express the the conversations, it it seems strange, but it's not because those are the things that are happening daily. Like, should it's I do that? My world, Lance. <laughs> should, I, should I do that? Shouldn't I? Well, yeah. you know, what? How's that going to serve me? You know, and it's amazing how it's, it's, it's crazy how like we have these fears and these, these things coming at us. And if you address them, like, Oh, I see you're trying to protect me. Okay. Well, don't worry. I'm all right. You know, like if you can really look at it like that. And I, I find that just the awareness of your thoughts, which comes from meditation and all this amazing stuff is, is just the first, is the first thing and being okay with that. Mm. It's okay. Like you're, you know, yeah, one of the, you know, one of the, the most asked questions with um, beginners uh, of meditation, you know, I, I work, I work both, I work with people who are beginners on their path. And I work with people who are like yourself, who are already like deeper in it and like have a higher drum beat, right? So there's different programs I've created for both of those kind of personas. And one of the beginner questions is always, I don't know how to meditate. How do I stop my thoughts? And I don't know where this notion comes from that with meditation, you need to stop your thoughts like this. It's, it's, not, it's not true. Yeah. When you can slow down a little bit so you can just watch the thoughts, you're already making progress, actually. Right? If you're just okay to be with your thoughts, you're making progress. I, I completely agree. It's that trying to be perfect aspect that we just need to forget. You're not going to be perfect, and that's perfect. You know, that's okay. It's okay. Like no one's going to be perfect at anything. And, and knowing that, I mean, what is perfect? Like we, like at what definition, yeah. who, you know what I mean? It's, it's it made perfect up. To have thoughts. Aren't those thoughts at times also helpful? Sitting there and just for two minutes, if you can sit for two minutes, that's a win reward, you know, be happy about that. The next day, add a minute on. It's like, that's where I started too. I started, I was really beating myself up. Like what should be happening? Should I feel this way? Should something fall out of the sky? Should I get a vision? And, and like those expectations are completely, you know, deceiving the whole purpose of why you're doing it. You're just supposed to just sit there 
And I've just realized this as because I always want to overanalyze it. And now I'm just like, oh, you know, I'm just going to chill here. I'm happy. I love silence personally. I love to put my, my earphones on and just be in silence. And just who cares if some, some days you're going to have those crazy thoughts and that's okay. Right. And some days it's like this blissful, you just go into this world. And I mean, that's okay too. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about when that kicked in for you, right? A few years ago <laughs> when, when the Eckhart Tolle and other um, teachers would show up in your life. And I mean, you and I met at a, a Guru Singh men's retreat with the Kundalini yoga tribe. So, I mean, you've, you've continued to show up and participate. Like what started, what started shifting away from those toxic personalities that you were inhabiting? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Well, I started meditating probably back in beginning of 2014. I was in Australia in Port Douglas, this little tropical town. And I didn't even really know what I was doing and the gold coast actually. And I started it, but then I stopped from it for like two or three years. And then I don't know. I just, there was, I didn't really notice anything until I really just peeled back all the toxic crap and started doing this stuff. But as I started to do it, I started to meet higher, I don't want to say higher level people, but more conscious people, right? I started to attract people that wanted to be better in life and help people and, and make a difference. And it just started to happen. And then I just sort of, I just started to learn different techniques, you know, like I started to just do it more and do it more. And then, you know, I, 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 I started to do um, actually some hypnotherapists with, you know, a good friend of mine, um, Adrian Wesley, we, we would go into that into deep trance and work on different beliefs that helped me. And then, you know, you start to meet on other amazing people like Dr. Nick Jensen, you know, these people just started coming in my life and it's like, Oh, you do that too. Oh, amazing. Oh, you do that too. And it's like, all of a sudden you're meeting these people that do the same stuff. And I don't know if that's what you're asking, but that's kind of the, that's kind of how it's evolved. Like I didn't plan on all of a sudden becoming this person that meditates and does the stuff. It just started to feel good. And I started to get like these like deep, connections in my meditation that when I finished, I was like, Whoa, I get it. Like, I was like, Whoa, you know, at first it was a chore, but then after you do that, you see why it's is and you start to feel better. And I mean, your listeners out there, probably I've, I've, most of them have tried this or done this. They're, they're pretty conscious in that regard. So I'm sure everybody can understand, you know, when you get there, it almost becomes like a healthy addiction, right? Like you want to have that connection and through yeah, it's that a practice, right? Yeah. And it, that's the thing. And it's a daily thing and you just get better and you become, you become, um, that becomes part of you is that connection to yourself because of all the external circumstances, you know, it's, it's a real issue. Our phones, you know, can I buy this? Can I buy that? What's going to fill the void? And everything you have is within already. And I, you know, I never Can realized I fill that. fill the void? That's a very interesting, interesting question, right? I mean, this is yeah. basically the, without drifting into that topic, but it's one of the principles of capitalism is to continuously exploit the void that we're feeling and selling us something, right? And yeah. um, if we look at people like Dr. Joe Dispenza and his work, who's like literally famous at this point for saying the words, go into the void, right? Yeah. In his meditations. And if, if you're not familiar with Dr. Joe Dispenza, oh. please look him up. He's incredible. Oh. Um, you know, it's like leaning into that void, yeah. leaning into the, the vast blackness or leaning into the stillness and meditating and setting your timer as, as Lance said, a few minutes a day. And then, you know, um, usually I do 11 or 22 minute meditation to just close my day. And when that's done, I'm always like, oh, that was short. But the first few minutes, no matter how amazing my day was, no matter how good my state is before, I'm like, okay, this is going to be sitting. And at the yeah. point when you reach the 22 minutes, you could probably go for a full hour. And sometimes I do. Yeah. But, but it's not even about that. It's not about comparatively speaking of like, oh, Julian does 60 minutes a day. I think maybe, maybe I should do 61 minutes. You know? It's yeah. not really about that. It's, for me, it's about the consistency because that's where the gold is. You know? Yeah. Well, I'm glad you say that because... I go through that every single day and I'm like, is this ever going to be, am I ever going to sit here and just like, but hearing that makes me feel better. So now when I do that, I'm going to know it's normal because I still, I judge. I'm like, well, why is this feel like a pain in the ass when I know it's going to be good? And then five minutes in, 
the time and you feels like 10 minutes, five minutes. And then the timer's up. You're like, Oh, I was just getting in the zone. Why that? Why is that over? <clears throat> you know, and it's so funny how that first two minutes can be a struggle and that's why people stop doing it. Yeah. It's, and also it, you know, it, it gets you in touch with thoughts that you might not want to look at. Right. This is, yeah. this is the other thing. Um, when you stop judging your uh, mental experience, and you just look at it, a lot of it is really silly. Most of it, six months later, you won't even remember at all that you ever thought of this, you know? Mm -hmm. so, so letting go and surrendering, I think, is um, a topic that comes up in almost every episode um, simply because letting go and surrendering to the greater flow, that one truth of love, that soul that fills everything, mm -hmm. you know, things change when you start surrendering to that things change in terms of how you feel, how your anxiety levels spark, how your uh, nervous system gets calmer. And I mean, if you're willing to go down that, that rabbit hole, mantras help so much big time syllables that you re re repeat, you know, that basically calm your nervous system because you're just doing, even if it's just like a ra ma ra ma in the, even if you don't do it out loud, but you do it in your head or, or, you know, simply I am who I am. These, these repetitions, they help you um, kind of not drift away into the oscillation of your mind's irregular pattern and you create a new pattern. Yeah, totally. You know, and I'm at this point in my life now where um, it's all, you know, when we go into something like the retreat we went to, my, I, I, my body wants to go back to like the old way, right? Into escape because I really truly believe that it knows the power that it has. And I feel like it's scared to tap into that power sometimes. So what happens is you go back to your, to the way you were doing it and not practicing that. And that's kind of what I want to change is get back into that, that pattern. But it, it was, it's just so easy and safe for me to like not do it, you know? And I think so many people fall into that when they get into something. Tell, tell us a little bit more about your like adversity with meditation and a spiritual practice, because I feel like, you know, it's often so easy to talk about like, oh, you just got to do it and stay consistent with it, which is basically what we've been saying. And I, yeah. this is what I believe in. But when we are transparent, honest, and open about what's like, what's just like so hard about it in some moments. And uh, maybe even at the men's camp retreat that we met outside of Vancouver, um, what, what showed up for you? Like, what's the, the pattern that's really being broken when, when you do a meditation or something for 60 minutes? Oh, yeah. That was, um, that was one of the most challenging. Some of those poses were some of the most challenging things I've had to ever do um, that I was, I was going through. Although it's a simple thing, I, I was like, part of me was like, I love this, but I hate this. You know? And I had to it was the feeling in my body wanted to quit, but I knew what was happening. Like it was like this constant, you know, be quiet. No, like this constant wanting comfort, wanting growth. And it's like just going, getting through that and be like, be quiet, both of you. Let's just sit through this. You know, it's like, it was literally like trying to shut, shut off these and just quiet that both of these things. And I was like, just don't worry. We're just going to get through that. It's almost like, it's almost like you're in a car driving somewhere and you're the parent, the parents driving. And then there's the two kids. Well, I want to go to McDonald's. Or I want to go here. I want to go there. And it's just like, all right, we're, we're on our way here. Just we're, once we get to the destination or, you know, whatever the destination, there's no destination, but you know, that's the goal. And then, you know, once you're there, those kids kind of quiet down, you know? And that's kind of how I felt. Totally. That's how, I, can, uh, I can relate. That's the feeling every time there is, um, and there, there is this, this kind of like hint in some of the practices is like, if you can smile. Yeah. Because the, there's the voice in your mind that is like, oh my God, this is going to be so hard. This is going to be the hardest thing I've ever done. And you're not even 30 seconds in and you don't know how long it goes. If it's 11 minutes of meditation, if it's, 20 minutes of Kriya yoga, or if it's just a breath work, it, it can feel like eternity. Yeah. But then there's the other voice that's like, if I just surrender, this is not going to be a problem. And that voice actually, that's the one that can actually allow your body to smile and just sit there. Yeah. Oh, okay. 
Yeah. I'll just put the smile on them. Or the inner athlete in me is like, no, this is you, you, you know, this is, this is it. This is like the, this is the thing that you got to challenge yourself, you know, like, and that's where I think that like healthy competitiveness from sports comes, you know, I don't like to compete with other people, but in that regard, you're competing against yourself and getting better. And I feel like that healthy competitiveness against yourself comes in, in full factor there, you know, because, 100%. you know, you're, you're like, okay, look, I know we got 31 minutes here. I think there are some of them with 31 minutes, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, if the guy beside me can do it, he, I can do it. You know what? Just because I'm new at this doesn't mean that I can't do this. And it was like, literally, eventually the noise quiets and then you're just like, it's over. And you're like, whoa, that was crazy. Like, those are the conversations I was having. So I I'm thought it was a conversation amazing. lens. I think it's really important to go through about or to share about the adversities of mindfulness practice. And yeah. make, make it, you know, part of, part of the honesty and transparency that sometimes these things are simple and easy and often they leave us with a feeling of expanded peace. Yeah. But they also bring up all the shadow sides and the controversies and the, the inner conflicts that we have, right? Yeah, and I think if somebody, beginner or whoever, whatever they're on their journey, just to know that that's okay. If you just, when you go into it, just go, look, there's going to be stuff come up. It's going to be annoying. That's fine. Just don't get attached to it. Don't think about it because it's normal, right? Like it's, it's, but people are always get, well, just from my past experience, I hear like, well, what's supposed to happen? It's like, there, you don't know what's going to happen. Mm. There's, there's not an answer for that. <laughs> That's the beautiful thing is letting go, but you're going to have thoughts. You're, of course you are, you know? But that can also be good for, for, for brainstorming as well. You know, you're, you, if, you, if you've just been coming up with a bunch of ideas and then you're like, okay, that's it. Shut it off now. You know, that's another thing I do is I just basically command before my meditation. I go, all right, I need to see the direction I need to go next. Like I literally say that. And after, you know, having my brain go crazy, setting, an intention. setting the intention and then all of a sudden, the right things happen. Is there something that falls out of the sky that's like, this is it? No, but I, I pay attention to the feelings of how things come into my life, what feels good, what doesn't, the people. And that's kind of how I base it, right? And Yeah, um, you know, what, you, what you're sharing there, and this is why I think we ended up on this topic, I feel is when we let the external personalities that we are in the movie of life govern what we do, right? comparative um, experiences like sport are kind of like the highlights. So it's not a, even a, a surprise that so many kids on the planet are chasing to become famous at sports because it's one of those external things that give us a lot of validation. The same with toxic behavior like drinking. When we let the external circumstances run the show, these things will show up. But once you start transforming and you really want the seed of consciousness that is inside of us, all of us, let that sprout it changes the way we address anything. And I think these are the times we're in. It's 2019. The, the planet is getting hotter. Forests are on fire. It is, it's a gong show when we look at politics and uh, you know, the geopolitical forces and economical forces that are out there because not all of them have your best interest in mind. Mm. And yet we kind of all dream that something like this might become possible one day. And so I think the only way how it can become possible is when we raise our consciousness, when yeah. we expand our frequency. Yeah, I agree. hundred um, percent. And I think, I don't even think a lot of people know about raising their consciousness, you know? And I, th I think the basic way for people to even understand that is to sit still <laughs> is to be, is to, that is how you start to realize that's the basis of realizing different levels of consciousness. Because if you try and tell somebody, hey, you're not conscious or this guy's more conscious, be like, what are you talking about? Right? But when you, when you say, and this is where Dr. Joe Dispenza is so amazing, man. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get him on my show at some point. The guy is one of the most important people on the planet, I feel, um, at, at, at communicating this message, right? Is that for you to have that that awareness that your consciousness is raising, you need to be able to sit there. But a lot of people need the science. They need to monitor what's actually happening. And a lot of the stuff he does is the Kundalini, the energy, the, the stuff that's been around for ages. Right. And just explaining yeah. that in a way that allows that shift for people to be like, okay, well, what is happening when I sit here? 
well, this is changing. This here is changing. Your energy is changing. And then it's monitored. You can see, then people go, oh, okay, I get it. And then it becomes like, well, once you've done that a few times, then you start to feel different and things, low level conscious activities don't attract you as much as they used to. Totally. And I, for someone just to explain consciousness to somebody, if someone was to say that to me, I would have been like, what are you talking about? You have to experience it, right? Like you words, have to. words only teach so much. Like yeah. generalizing words don't teach, life experience teaches. Yeah. And the right person, the right person communicating that message so that it sticks is super important. Communication is one of the most important things that you could have the same thing 12 ways but that, you know, or, you know, 10 ways and the 11th person says it to you and it's like, oh, boom, I get it. Mm. It's like, you know, that's the thing. So having the right person with the right message, with the right clarity allows for more of a shift in people because so many people have the misconception that it has to be this certain way and everything has to be so black and white. Like if you're, you know, in Kundalini yoga, you've got to be this way if you're this and that. So people don't do it because they, they're afraid of going into some box. That's, and that's still the head talking, right? And we yeah. talked about that on, on your show. If you want yeah. to check it out, it's episode, I believe, 88 on University of it's Adversity. A great, it's a great number too for you. Yeah, <laughs> it, 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 prosperity number, right? It's, it's, it's so interesting how much we're stuck in our head brains. But to switch it up right now a yeah. little bit, I'm going to yeah. get us out of, out of this part of our conversation <laughs> and segue into Good. another part of the conversation because I want to get a little bit deeper into some of your values and the way, sure. the way that they've shown up for you. And I'll ask you some rapid fire questions just for now. Sure, man. So first question, if you want something done right, do it yourself or better as a team? Uh, better as a team. Plant trees or fly to Mars? <laughs> Plant trees. Ocean water or lake water? What do you prefer? Uh, it depends what I'm, what, what I'm going for, but I love the ocean. Nice. Meat or veggies? I like both. Nice. Like yeah, you both. said don't ask me about meat or veggies. <laughs> there you go. Water or kombucha? Water. Cannabis or alcohol? Neither. Jungle or desert? Jungle. Lance, if you were to define the word purpose in your own words, can you do that for us? Yeah, it's just finding that light inside of you and under and, and basically bringing that light to life and following that as your path, you know, and your purpose in life may be, may change depending on where you're at and your growth. But I would say it's allowing that light to shine and that light may change as you grow. And it's super important to listen to that. And to really, you're basically, you know, you're, you're, you're allowing yourself to be who you are. And by finding that and making that your path, that becomes your purpose. So yeah, owning your light, following that. Beautifully put. What is required for you to experience trust? Um... I trust people right off the go until they give me a reason not to. Um, but I feel vulnerability, it comes down to that human connection. If, I, if, if somebody can, if we have some sort of like, I find this too, if you can find a common connection with somebody, the trust kind of some sort of you've been through something together or um, some sort of connection then that allows me to trust you even more, you know? But generally as a human, I like to give, I always like to give people the benefit of the doubt. Like if somebody says something, well, what reason would I have to not believe you, right? And that's the way I think we need to look at things. But obviously that's not the case for everybody. But for me, you know, that human connection, if you can be vulnerable and honest, you know, about your story, I know I can be, then that creates that, that trust for me. I hear that. Yeah, I think trust is an, an interesting one that everyone gets to ponder a little deeper. Yeah. And what about, what about happiness? You know, we're in a society where happiness, especially in North America, has been like 
part of this this driving the quest has been happiness yeah and yet all of us love happiness i mean i, I guess you know there there is an, a, a truth to it as well so in your own words like what what is happiness to lance um actually i had somebody paint a really good picture for me um she was on my episode um karen samuelson she's actually an author amazing and once she said this to me it made more sense and i think um Tommy Rosen kind of talked about it as well at our retreat, who's amazing, by the way, also. Um, it's, uh, Dr. Nick actually talked about this. This is why it's great to hear this question because, you know, pleasure and happiness are two different things. Pleasure is like that instant gratification, almost like this is the exact thing as well, like perfect picture for me and, and your audience that I really took away from this was it's like that jolt of like, high fructose corn syrup. It's like that sugar rush pleasure, right? And although, you know, a couple people have said that, it's stuck with me. And now I'm like, wow, that's an amazing analogy. So it's like, you, pleasure is like that, like temporary thing right away. It gives you the short-term pleasure, but long, it doesn't make you happy long-term. Happiness is more of a long-term game. It's almost like temporary temporary, not unhappiness, but um, challenges in order to install that long-term happiness. So happiness is kind of withholding on certain things with knowing that what the, your greatest purpose is. And even though those instant gratifications aren't happening, you know that long-term happiness is on its way. Fulfillment is on its way. So for me, happiness is fulfillment. And fulfilling yourself through those promises that you keep with yourself on a daily basis and, you know, not getting stirred away to those, those, those pleasures that just provide you with some sort of um, instant hit with, again, that void that you think will be fixed from that, but it's not, it just goes away. And then you need more of it. Kind of like the sugar rush, right? You need more of it, more of it, more of it. And you're like, well, wait a minute. I thought that was going to fix it. But if you can withhold and you can balance and you can just stay strong and know your long-term goal, and, and that is what brings happiness. And that, from hearing it from a couple different people, that's in my own words. But for, for me, that's, you know, that's what it is. You know, I hope that, hope that made sense. And it couldn't have been, it made sense, man. It couldn't have been a better, <laughs> a better segue. Like you can't even make this, this stuff up. Because what I'm going to ask you last year, this is, this is the question that started this podcast, that started this quest I'm on for Holistic Visions. You spoke about happiness being a long-term experience, a sustainable experience, you know, almost like a regenerative experience, not a short-term pleasure, right? So if you were to look into the future and say, I'm going to connect with seven generations, so 200, 210 years going forward, what is the long-term happiness or the, the long-term world you would love to see become possible or you believe in possible or you, you can be patient to know that it's going to be possible? Just always thriving in the human connection, like always understanding how important it is to lift others, always having that you want to lift others. You want to make people feel better than they did before after being in contact with you. And I feel like if humans can keep that level of awareness to, instead of trying to bring people down and compare, always try and lift people up, you know? Like, <clears throat> I think just as humans, as, as we evolve and technology takes over, there's going to be less and less contact. And I feel like to keep that human spirit alive, you, you need to be looking to inspire others. And that human connection and, and always wanting to, you know, add value to people's lives, you know, and that's just keeping that, that human spirit alive is, is for me is super, super important. And who knows where it's going, where it's going to happen in the next generations. Right. But, um, that human connection and, and doing your best to uplift that spirit within people is, is, is super, super important from my, my perspective. Beautiful. <laughs> I like that answer. I think it, it's, it ties a beautiful bow on our conversation here and the way you started from how human connection has always been at the core of your experience as well. Lance, 
I know people can find your podcast called University of Adversity, Spotify, iTunes. You got a, a, a beautiful looking website as well. What other, um, what, what else do you want to share? Is there anything else you'd love to get people to, to look at or to be aware of? Yeah, I, I just urge people to check out the podcast. You know, I, it's, we interview people who have all walks of life, who have gone through different things and gone on to become successful. And success doesn't necessarily mean, you know, um, broke to billionaire. That's not what success is to me. There's a lot of different things. And um, it's just really important because I, I really want to continue to bring that message of inspiration to people because that's what I needed in my life. I can only go off what I needed and inspiration in the dark moments is what I needed. So I encourage people to, to check it out. And yeah, I mean, that's, that's, I want to continue to evolve and I want to continue to connect with people and anybody that feels they have a story or they would like to share. I'm always open to, to hear. And I want to share that with the world. I want to, you know, add light to the world um, instead of the darkness, which is evident in many places. So. Yeah. Other than that, you know, just, just working away and the podcast game and it's, it's exciting time. It's a great time to be alive. I hope brother. Thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing your insights and for opening up about the adversities and what it took you to continuously show up in life. Thanks, man. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks so much.